Um, so, this is my kind of crazy lecture. Uh, ten topics, randomly related, in 24 minutes. I have a stopwatch to help me because I'm probably going to run over. So, ten topics. If you get bored of one, you only have to wait two minutes for the next one. So, uh, um, This isn't the first topic. This is just me talking about myself, so you know who I am. Um, I've been making games for a little bit over 15 years. Um, I've been a designer primarily. I've also been a producer. Uh, I've done programming. I've done art. I've done sound. Uh, I've done all kinds of things. So I've had a kind of pretty varied career up to this point. And two years ago, I founded my own company. So uh, we're firstly going to talk about that. Um, so how do you get a company from nothing to where it is now in 12 months? Um, so in 2012, which is 24 months ago, I uh, left LucasArts and I started making my own indie games. I made, I made five games, there they are. Which, uh, has anyone ever heard of any of those games? Whoa, oh. <laughs> One person who I happen to know. So um, I was kind of chasing the dream of being an indie developer and at the end of 2012, I realized that none of these games had been successful and my whole adventure in independent development had failed. So uh, at the end of the year, I kind of had to rethink what I was doing and was I actually going to carry on development or go back and get a job? Um, so I rethought everything and kind of focused on the fact that I hadn't been thinking of it like a business. I needed to refocus my like whole thing about making games and I realized that I needed people to help me, such as a publisher. Um, so I set out to find a publisher. I came to Casual Connect last year. I was one of the Indie Prize people. I think I won something. And um, I met Congregate, who uh, ended up publishing our game. I partnered with them and then I started a company and I realized that I had to go all in on this. I was working part-time doing jobs and things, so I quit everything. 100% went into making the game. So I had to build a company really, really fast, but I also had to build a game really, really fast. Um, so the first thing I realized I needed to do was find a space to work in, because working in my bedroom wasn't going to be effective. It was going to destroy communication. So um, the GSC, Game Solution Center, which is a Singapore um, body that gives you free space to work in, they gave us a room instantly. First of all, we had to sit in a tiny room, and then we got a bigger room. And um, so I got in a space. I worked out where my weaknesses were, which was network coding, and I realized I wasn't going to have time to balance the game. So I employed a network engineer. And I got a friend to come and do design, and, well, not friend, employee. <laughs> and, um, and then I realized that the most important thing was while all this stuff was going on, I still had to be making progress on the game every day. So that's like the number one thing if you start doing this. So where are we now? 12 months on, we've uh, released Tiny Dice Dungeon with Congregate. Um, it's had over 1 million downloads. I think it was 1.3 million downloads yesterday. And we got featured on both the stores. Again, thanks to our publisher, I think. Um, we're also now a licensed Nintendo developer, a uh, licensed PlayStation developer, and idea Xbox. And we have nine staff, so uh, managed to kind of get somewhere. So, topic two, um, pixel art. Why it is tet awesomes. Uh, so, pixel art is a wonderful thing to create. There's lots of reasons for it. I think that very hardcore 3D high-end art is quite hardcore looking to people, and it puts off a certain market. Uh, if you go with casual art, that puts off people like me. I don't like it. I, I much prefer something that's a bit edgy and a bit more adult. So pixel art kind of, to me, bridges that gap. Um, it's also quicker to produce. Uh, and amazingly, if you're working with some high-end assets, you're going to fill up your memory and the device really quickly. Our whole game is on three 1024 by 1024 textures, I think. Um, things are annoying about pixel art. It can take longer to animate because you've obviously got to redraw each frame. Um, some people think it's a bit crappy looking, um, and obviously a lot of games using pixel art these days, but I don't think that matters. I think when you've got movies like Wreck-It Ralph and things like that coming out, I think we're seeing that pixel art has actually become accepted by the mainstream, and the people that push against it are probably like indie kids who feel like their cool pixel art that was theirs has been taken by society. You know? um, are you making pixel art? Does it suck? Um, a lot of people try and make pixel art, and it looks diabolical. Uh, they do things like draw high-res images and resize them, and various stupid things like that that don't work, and they don't understand pixel art. There is a, a deep art to making it, and you have to study pixel art a lot to get good at it. Topic three. Okay, the power of staying small and how to do it. So when I started the company, the first thing that I realized I needed was having people in key positions, making sure that everyone was a contributor. So every single person who works at my company can do something very important in that company. I don't have a marketing guy or a business guy or people like that. It's all about making the game and getting it done. And that made everyone feel kind of equal. Um, 
People were multidisciplinary, like my designer, who could also do art. Um, before I started my company, I worked with a friend for a little bit, and we had kind of emotional discussions, and it all got really heavy, and that actually detracted from me making progress. So I would advise not working with your friends. Um, um, another thing, I'm very, very passionate about making video games, and I think that having that passion kind of rubs off on the people around you, and their passion kind of grows with you, and they all get into it, and that makes you more productive as a company. We also have a very flat management structure, so I think everyone feels like they contribute, I hope. You know. Topic four. Um, so we've all dreamt about going to a beautiful paradise, taking our laptops. You know, me, as someone who can do art, design, music, and everything, I always thought, one day I'm going to live on an island paradise and program games and release them. You know, it's going to be amazing. So I did this last year. At the end of 2012, I went to Langkawi for a week to uh, live the dream. So I'm going to dispel the myths of what it's like to live the dream. There are many problems. Problem number one, electricity. So uh, I got up on this beautiful day, and I walked along the beach trying to find a bar that would give me electricity to power my uh, laptop. It took about four hours. I ended up in Babylon Hotel, I think it's called. I was sitting at the tiny little bar, which you can see on the left there, in a really awkward, hunched-over position trying to code, and it really was not ideal. So I kind of wasted half the day finding electricity. So day number two, I realized I needed the internet. Um, that was the only place I could find that combined electricity and internet, and that was not really living the dream on a paradise island, was it? I was just sitting in Starbucks. I could have been anywhere in the world. Number three, you are a loser. So what this means is that as I sat there trying to be productive, making my game, everyone around me was on holiday, drinking, you know, hanging out with their friends, doing cool things, and I realized that I felt like a social outcast. I felt like a real weirdo, you know? At one point, I was sitting in a bar at like 2 a.m. programming, because I wasn't there with anyone. I was there on my own to code, you know? And it was, very, uh, it was a very odd experience. Um, so how do you tackle feeling so outcast? With problem number four, alcohol. So I started drinking, um, usually about 2 p.m. I started having a beer. Um, as you can see, I wrote that particular line of comment at 2 a.m. You wrote this drunk, it probably doesn't work. We are scaling Dwan in Y, motherfuckers. So I've never checked that code, and it's in our game, but I'm not sure that it really works. It certainly shouldn't be a vector 2, I know that much. But um, anyway, so back to another topic. Uh, topic number five. Oh, and I'm doing OK for time. Amazing. Um, your office space can mean everything. So if you look at that, that's a kind of decent layout for an office, a lot of space. Um, there's some little dividers and things. Um, other traditional office spaces are like this. Um, this kind of office space is absolutely horrendous. Um, whilst people enjoy working in these kind of, you know, they've got their own area, they've got a lot of space to work, but it's, if you look at that, there's six people. Every time they want to actually have a conversation, they have to stop working and stand up, because they're so broken apart. They have all these dividers, none of it works. So our office is quite extreme, um, maybe a bit too extreme, but <laughs> that's, that's how we work. So we can see each other, we make eye contact with each other all the time. Um, everybody knows everything that's going on. Um, we all feel really involved, and we, we actually have a lot of fun. Um, Zengami are a studio next to us, and they get upset with us singing and things like that. So we have a very, very close relationship, and it makes us a lot more productive. Topic six, publishers versus you versus the world. So publishers are evil, right? because we're all indie, indie dreamers, right? So obviously, there is a preconception that publishers are bad. Um, when I was at PAX, I was on a panel, and we'd, you know, I was the only person of the indie guys talking that had a publisher, and everyone else kind of was quite dismissive of it. So these are some of the reasons people think publishers suck. Right? They take away your indie hipster freedom. They take money for doing not very much, right? Of course they do. You know, you're the one making the game, and you can't trust them. Right? So let's, let's go into those. Topics and explain why they, I think they're wrong. Um, so obviously, I made five games on my own in that one year, and I released them. Every single game I made, I learned something. I got better. But at that rate, how much would I have learned? How long would it have taken me to understand more and more about the market? A very, very long time. As soon as I joined with Congregate, um, there's many, many people there. And collectively, Congregate may have not published many mobile apps at that point, but the people working there had, you know, there's such a massive resource for information and knowledge. 
and they guide me and give me advice and stuff like that. So they help me turn my my uh, my business, well, my my dream into a business. Um, the other thing that people think is that they're going to change your game. You know, it's like what they wouldn't sign you in the first place if they didn't like what you were making. They're not going to come in and like you know vastly redirect it. Why why do that? Why not pick something that you like in the first place? So that's kind of common sense, I think. Um, they make money for not doing very much. Well, obviously, I've mentioned that we've got regular guidance. We had some technical issues. They had people on hand to help us. Um, and they, I believe, I don't know, maybe Tiny Dice would have got these features. I don't know. But I think that that's largely as a result of us working with a publisher that we got such prominent features on Google Play and uh, the App Store. So you can't trust them. Um, obviously, I met many publishers, and they tend to seem like nice people. It's very hard to judge, maybe. But it's, uh, the thing is, a publisher is based on their reputation, right? So if they treat people badly, you can usually find it on the internet and find out about them and things like that. And once they start treating people badly, people will stop going to them. So you know, it's in their interest to treat you fairly, I think. So topic number seven, finding a publisher. Um, the first thing I did last year when I bought my game was that it was a relatively interesting concept. I hadn't seen anything like it on the App Store, and people still say it's unique. But I didn't care about NDAs. I just showed my game to everyone because essentially, if you have an NDA that you make someone sign, it's going to make it, you know, you're going to limit the amount of people that can see your game. Um, and also, it's going to make people less, they're not likely to sign NDAs anyway because, you know, they might be making something similar and it's, it's just complicated. So I wouldn't care about your idea and keeping it to yourself. I'll just share everything. Um, are you excited? Yes, I am excited. Um, I'm very excited about video games, and I like to project that to people. I really am very passionate about what I do, and I think that really helps you when you approach a publisher. I mean, if you're like, "Here's my game, it's all right," oh, you know, um, you're not going to really emote that you care about this thing, and obviously you care. Um, another thing is to talk about what you know. I think um, if I go up to a publisher, I'm like, "Yeah, the monetization strategy is going to be this, and we're going to use user acquisition like this." I mean, that's not stuff that's any of my concern, right? And they're going to think that I'm a very closed individual. I'm not open to them actually you know, working things their way. They, they, they need to know that they can actually take control of certain elements, I would say. You know. um, so money. Um, this is obviously another big thing with publishers. Uh, if I was any of you looking for a publisher, and a publisher wanted to sign my game but wasn't going to give me any kind of advance or any kind of funding in any way, then I would not sign with that publisher. I think you have to share the risk in order to know that they're invested in it. I mean, it's obviously a risk, right? We all think that if you sign with a publisher and it's 50-50 and they release it and they don't bother promoting it, it's a win-win situation for them, right? So I think they have to get involved in the risk for it to be you know, an amicable deal. Topic number eight, why you aren't a game designer. So I think a lot of people that start businesses, they come in, they've got a big idea for a game, and then they're going to start a business, and then they kind of direct the game. If you think about game design in a traditional sense, a game designer starts on the lowest rung doing tiny things, then they start building bigger and bigger things, and they climb up. And eventually, after five or six years, they run a project. And the reason that they're given the job of running a project is because they've learned everything leading up to it. So when they have a big idea, they understand all the things that go into making it. Um, so I think that business guys who come in and start a business because they've got an idea of making a game that's a bit like another game, um, it's not a great starting point for your company. Um, yeah, a concept is not a design, as I say. Um, there are certain things you can look out for in your company to know that it's going wrong. Um, these are they, you know. Um, there's many other things like that. But essentially talking about you know, story and characters, you know, things like that, when you haven't actually worked out the core game mechanic is obviously wrong. You know, it's a very easy to daydream and get off the topic of actually progressing. You know, pick something easy to do, that's what people do, rather than doing the hard bit that's making the game fun. Um, Talking about sequels and expansion packs and all that kind of stuff. It, again, it's just daydreaming. You don't have any success. You don't have a franchise. You don't have anything. You, you've just got to make your first game. Focus on the next step, not the step that's miles away. OK, topic nine. We're nearly there, aren't we? Oh, I'm going to be faster. Wow. Um, interns. Why do you want interns? Cheap labor, right? Woo! Right? Um, so yeah, this is kind of what a lot of people think, but it's a complete misconception. I mean, if, if you get an intern in, uh, in general, internships are about three months long. The first month, 
they will be b useless, you know? They will not know how you work, they will not be very productive. The second month, they will finally start to learn things, how you do things, and then um, by the third month, they'll become productive, and they'll become a really vital member of your team, and then they'll leave. So uh, it's, uh, if you're gonna take that approach of cheap labor, you may as well just employ somebody properly, because it's not gonna help you. Um, so for me, the goals of having interns, and I, I do love having interns, is that it gives me a better reputation around the kind of students. So when people graduate, they might come to me for a job. Um, and also, I, I like to try and get people on internships who are at the end of their education, so that I can give them a job afterwards. So I see it as like a probation, a good chance for me to get to know if they're good. Because usually, probation isn't long enough to actually you know, figure out somebody's skills. Topic 10, cross-platform development. The challenges of sharing code across all of these. It is possible. I think, as we will see. So you're gonna hear about my amazing technical background as a programmer. Um, I started using XNA a long time ago, because it could make Xbox 360 games, and it was amazing. Um, I learned it, then after I left Lucas, one of my friends told me that I could use this thing called Monogame and Xamarin, which would allow my XNA code um, to run. XNA is a Microsoft framework, by the way, for making games, originally designed for Windows Phone, and the Xbox 360. So I could actually write games in XNA and get them running on the iPhone, which was like a revelation to me, because I'd never done C++, I was scared of Objective-C, all that kind of stuff. Then, amazingly, Monogame also works on Android. Um, Monogame is a community project driven to make XNA run on everything. Um, it, it usually takes a little bit of tweaking here and there to get to work exactly how you want it to, but it is a pretty good starting point. Um, once I started employing people, they were like, why are you using XNA? It's not even supported anymore. Why are you doing this? You know, we should be using Unity, or we should be using whatever, you know. The Unity call got laid at me very many times, and I was very resistant, because, well, I think if we go back to that first slide, because I'm too old to learn new things is probably a good reason. I just didn't want to change, so, and I'd started. Also, I had five games already using the existing code base, so if you start splitting across different types of platform, then you've got more things to support. You get a problem, you have to fix it twice, right? So it turns out we were going to try and build something that would allow XNA to work on PlayStation. And suddenly, Xamarin was announced for PlayStation platform and Monogame along with it. So we're like, woo, don't have to do any work. Amazing. Um, so Wii U, uh, they use Unity. So you get a free Unity license on Wii U. So we wrote a custom XNA wrapper for Unity. So we're not using Unity in the way you're supposed to use Unity at all. We're just running XNA in it but it's exactly the same code, you know? Um, Xbox One, even though Unity uh, XNA was written for the Xbox, it's not natively supported in Xbox One, so again, we use Unity because the idea Xbox program gives you a free Unity license. Uh, web, again, Unity player with our weird embedded thing, and it's not ultimately fast, it's not super optimized, but it does work, and the web isn't something that we're massively huge on yet. I mean, we're gonna be doing something, I think. But. PC, amazingly, XNA actually works on the PC. Wow, a platform that actually, not that PC, I don't think, but some PCs. And so then we come to our super experimental crazy one, which is the 3DS. Um, so at one point we were thinking about writing a C-sharp compiler for the 3DS, because it only supports C++. And that was deemed three months of risk that might not pay off in any actual result. So now what we're doing is we have a C++ engine being written that has all the same calls as XNA, and then we use this thing, Tangible Software Solutions C-sharp to C++ Converter, which we've just started using like two days ago, and it takes all the code, crunches through it, and spits it out in C++. Many, many errors, but um, we're basically gonna work through, we're gonna add some custom calls for memory management in the C-sharp code, so that every time we compile, we don't have to manually edit any of this code. I think the big risk is that if we are doing an automated process to take C-sharp and turn it into C++, but we have to actually manually edit that C++ code at the end that will make mistakes, and it's just really bad idea, super labor-intensive. So instead, we tag C-sharp, and then we'll run a batch file that will convert it and fix it. Um, so yeah, this is kind of what we've got. You know, it's a single code base across all platforms, and the issues, I guess, it's a harder code base to manage, because you have like an if Android connect to Android Google Play Store, if iOS do this kind of thing. Um, obviously, the code gets bigger, it gets a bit bloated because of that. Um, the memory management issues on C-sharp, so we are actually having to write weird empty functions, or I think we're gonna have to write weird empty functions. Um, 
And, and it says, obviously, you know, you might make mistakes, but usually what happens is someone will write something, you know, iPhone, do this, and they'll submit the code. I'll open it up on the PC and it won't run. It's like, it's very quick to find it, so. And that is zero minutes, and that is it. Has anyone got any questions? No. Good. Any questions? Oh, fantastic. I have one, I have one. Oh. Hello? Right. Hello. I have one. All right. Good. Um, so, <laughs> thanks for that. I think it's very, you know, uh, your, your experience being, you know, a uh, developer slash artist, designer for AAA companies going to doing your own thing is very insp inspiring for the indie community. So, just wanted to, you know, just raise it out there. What, what was your biggest challenge in the transition and how did you overcome it? Uh, the biggest transition was I went from having a very good salary to having no salary whatsoever. And I became a part-time teacher at DigiPen and things like that. But it was really hard. I mean, I woke up in the middle of the night and, you know, I was coding at 4 a.m. and I'd go to bed at 2 a.m. and things like that. And, and I still don't sleep very much. So I think that's the hardest thing is I do feel a sense of massive stress and pressure because I, life was easy when you have a job. You know there's money at the end of the month. So, and I think that's the thing that hits most people when they go indie from a big company is that, that all the security is gone. It's always easier to come the other direction because you didn't have any security, so you're building it for yourself. Um, yeah, and how did I overcome it? Still haven't really overcome it. <laughs> nice. Okay, thank you. Another okay. thing that you raised a while ago is about marketing. So just one, one, one thing. So you guys don't have like marketing team. Well, or I, a marketing I, guy or I, I well, personally inside we don't have anything like that. No business guy, no marketing. But that's why we partner with a publisher. I mean, we can't ever expect to compete with you know, publishers out there are spending massive amounts of money on marketing and they've got people that are experts. For us to actually even attempt to compete with that, we'd need a whole, you know, 20 experts and we need, you know, millions of dollars in the bank. So there's no point in even trying, I think. And um, that's my feeling. Obviously, I'm sure indie developers want to do self-marketing and all that kind of stuff, but I think it's uh, getting harder and harder to succeed doing that. All right. 